Hey everyone, when Hoyoverse dropped the Myriad Celestia trailer, it completely blew my mind. And ever since the trailer's release, I've been thinking and doing non-stop research on the eons of Honkai Star Rail. So I figured today I would make a video series and go through all the lore I could find on every single eon mentioned in the game, of which there are 18 that we currently know of. There is a ton of lore to cover and to make things easier for you all, I'll make sure to put down timestamps in all of my videos. In part one of this video, series, we are going to cover the general lore of the eons and then talk about Akivili the Trailblazer and Nanook the Destruction. So without further ado, let's just jump right into it. Now, before we get into the lore of each individual eon, we should cover some background information on the eons, the paths, and the overall structure of the world and Honkai Star Rail. So, the first question we should probably address is who or what is an eon? In the most simple of terms, the eons are essentially the gods of the Honkai Star Rail universe. Each eon is associated with a specific attribute or ideal, which is called a path. So, for example, the Eon Akivili is associated with the Path of the Trailblaze. We'll revisit this idea of a path in just a few moments. Now, the interesting thing about the Eons is that they must ascend to claim their title as a god. But how do they do this? According to various lore entries, all intelligent beings have the ability to ascend to Eonhood. However, in order for the ascension to occur, the intelligent being must embody a path. The exact mechanics of how this works is not super clear, but Welt speculates that all paths are a part of the imaginary element. When the right conditions are met, an intelligent being can take over a part of the imaginary, thus creating a path that represents a specific ideal. Once this occurs, the intelligent being ascends to eonhood and is now able to freely harness the energy from the newly born path. It's important to note that while the eons are free to manipulate their respective path's energy, they are also bound by the rules of their path, which is known as a prima mobile. Also, once a path is established, any living being can draw upon the power of that path, but only if their will or belief is strong enough. Organisms that are able to do so are known as path striders. Another way to access the power of a path is to be blessed by an eon. Seeing as the eons are able to freely allocate the power of their paths, they can also lend their power to a mortal, elevating their status to something known as an emanator. Typically, emanators are individuals that are favored by their respective eon, hence why they are blessed with a significant portion of their power. Also, when it comes to power levels, emanators are much stronger than path striders since they receive their blessings directly from an eon. So, assuming that an eon can limitlessly control the power of their path, wouldn't that mean that they are omnipotent immortal beings? And that's where things get quite interesting because eons can die. We learn of this from Kafka during the Shinzo main story questline. Some examples of fallen eons are along the permanence in Idrilla the Beauty. According to Kafka, there are three ways to kill an eon. Number one, paths of overlapping concepts and ideas will eventually come together. More specifically, when paths overlap, the broader path will absorb the narrower path. This occurred when Shipei the Harmony absorbed Enna the Order. Number two, eons can kill one another. For example, Tezeronth the Propagation was eliminated by another eon. And the third and final way to kill an eon was not revealed to us yet in the game. However, my personal theory is that an eon can cease to exist when they break their prima mobile. In other words, straying from their intended path should cause an eon to fade away. Either way, I suspect we will find out what the third way is once we complete the Shienzo main story questline. So what happens to the underlying path after an eon's death? Well, it's important to note that once a path is opened, it cannot be closed even if the eon presiding over a path dies or disappears. The only exception to this rule is when two paths merge. An example of this would be when the order and the harmony merged, the path of the order ceased to exist. Because paths cannot be closed, any factions or groups associated with the path can continue to persist long after an eon's death. The perfect example being the Nameless who continue to explore the cosmos under the path of the Trailblaze. And that about covers all the background info you need to know regarding the eons and the paths. Of course, there are still a ton of unanswered questions regarding the eons and the paths, like why do eons exist? How did the first eon come into being? Or who or what created the rules that govern the eons and the paths? But these are all questions I'm sure we'll find the answer to as we move forward in our journey in Honkai Star Rail. Now for the fun stuff, let's get into the lore behind each individual eon. 
First up, we have Akivili, the eon that once presided over the path of the Trailblaze. According to Himiko, Akivili originated from a lonely planet called Pagana. At some point, Akivili ascended to his role as Eon of the Trailblaze and departed from Pagana to explore the unknown edges of the universe and to locate the endpoint to the Tree of Existence. As Akivili traversed the cosmos, they would lay down star rails to connect all the worlds they visited together. Along their travels, Akivili would attract the attention of mortals and quickly grew fond of them. With every stop, more and more people would join Akivili on the Trailblaze. These individuals who joined Akivili on their adventures were eventually known as the Nameless. Together with their Eon, the Nameless and Akivili would set off on fantastical journeys. Utilizing the Astral Express, they would travel from world to world, exploring the unknown guided by the four principles of the Trailblaze, exploration, understanding, establishing, and connection. Sadly though, the good times would not last. We don't actually know what exactly happened as there are no surviving records of the event, but apparently there was some sort of accident that occurred which ended up killing Akivili and ending their journey. Despite their Eon's death, the Nameless would continue on the path of trailblazing. However, the spreading influence of the Stellarons and Fragmentum would throw the Star Rail into dysfunction. This ultimately results in the Astral Express grounding itself leading to its eventual abandonment by the Nameless. Years later, Himiko would discover the Express and dedicate herself to repairing it. After restoring the Express to its original form, Himiko would set forth on a trailblazing voyage to explore the universe. In the present day, Himiko, Welt, Don Hung, March 7th, Pom Pom, and the MC serve as the main crew of the Astral Express. Now something that I found really interesting about Akivili's background story was that all the journeys that they embarked on started and ended on Pagana, their home planet. This likely means that the MC's journey will end at Pagana or that we will at some point stop by Akivili's home planet. Additionally, the world of Pagana seems to be a reference to a book called The Gods of Pagana published by Lord Dunsany in 1905. The Gods of Pagana is a collection of short stories about a group of gods and prophets that existed in a fictional world. In the book, a god by the name of Mana Yudsushai creates the universe and the gods that inhabit it. After this one act, the god falls asleep, leaving the quote-unquote lesser gods to their own devices. These lesser gods then get to work creating life and populating the universe with their own creations. That being said, if Mana Yudsushai ever wakes up from their slumber, it would lead to the total destruction of the gods and the universe. If this sounds familiar to you, this is because the gods of Pagana inspired H.P. Lovecraft to create his own pantheon of gods and cosmic beings. Specifically, Mana Yudsushai seems to serve as the inspiration for the ever-slumbering Azathoth from Lovecraft's Cthulhu Mythos. Anyways, I got a bit off track here, but the main premise of the gods of Pagana could potentially have some parallels with Honkai Star Rail. Perhaps there was a god creator that made the universe of Honkai Star Rail and left it in the care of the eons. I know this may be a fringe theory, but something to consider as Hoyoverse is known to make various real-world references in their games. Another thing we learned was that Akivili loved being around mortals, but what were his interactions with the other eons like? Though we don't have a whole lot of lore on this, we do get a pretty good idea of what the other eons think of Akivili through the simulated universe. If you recall, in the simulated universe, Herda has the MC simulate themselves as Akivili to allow her to study the other eons. Though most of the interactions are mostly unremarkable, there were a few that stood out to me. The first eon we meet with is Klepoth, and they seem to have been on fairly friendly terms with Akivili. When the simulated Akivili appears before Klepoth, the Eon of Preservation issues a warning to this simulated version of Akivili. My interpretation of this interaction was that Klepoth was trying to warn Akivili of the existential threat that endangers the living universe. The next intriguing encounter we have is with Fuli, the Remembrance. In our second meeting, Fuli tells us something very interesting. Chaos turns into time. Your dereliction of duty will pass. The volume is no longer proportional. The stars are reduced. One step, two steps, three feet. Away from everything. Be careful. The Elio train moves forward. The baby falls to the ground. The cancer is growing. 
This quote from Fuli gives us a better picture of the current state of the universe, as well as issues Akivili with a warning regarding future events. Though I don't want to speculate too much here, this seems to be a warning to Akivili that the fate of the universe sits on the edge of a knife. Every decision or step forward will lead us closer to the end, be it good or bad. Additionally, when Fuli tells Akivili that their dereliction of duty will pass, I interpreted this as the return of the Eon of the Trailblaze or a hint that someone will take on this title from Akivili. But I could be wrong on this and it's still too early to say what this quote means in terms of the story at large. Lastly, Fuli talks about Elio forging a path forward amidst all the chaos, which only confirms the importance of Elio and the Stellaron hunters in shaping the future. The next most interesting interaction with the Eon, and probably the most chaotic one, was with Aha, the Elation. I wanted to save most of the lore here for my future video in this series for Aha, but let's just say they enjoyed messing around with Akivili and played a prank on them, if you can even call it that. So basically Aha infiltrated the Astral Express for about a year, and when the time was right, they decided to blow up the train along with the Nameless. Though I'm sure it set back Akivili and the Nameless, it seems that they were able to recover from this event. And in the dialogue with Aha, they state that they miss Akivili and apologize for the little stunt that they pulled. Although I'm not sure how genuine this apology is, especially since Aha seems to pull these kind of chaotic pranks all the time with little to no regard for others. Lastly, I wanted to talk about Akivili's encounter with Yao Shi. Based on statements from Yao Shi, it seems that Akivili and Yao Shi have crossed paths before. However, Yao Shi seems less than delighted by Akivili's appearance. In fact, they say it would be better if Akivili were, quote, removed from the cycle of being, end quote, so that they could be set free from suffering. We'll go more in depth into what this means when we get to Yao Shi later in this series, but I just thought it was interesting that Yao Shi looked down at Akivili. While we do run into the other eons in the simulated universe, these particular interactions really stood out to me. Specifically, I feel like these interactions give us a better picture into Akivili's relationship with the other eons. The other run-ins that we have with other eons, for example, Lan, and forgive my pronunciation, IX, X, or, or nine, can someone in the comments let me know how I'm supposed to say this? Anyways, the other encounters we'll cover more in depth later in this video series, just cause those specific interactions didn't really tell us more about Akivili. When learning about Akivili, another thing that really stood out to me was all the lore surrounding the Astral Express. We're told by Himiko that Akivili created the Express and used it to traverse the universe alongside the Nameless. We're also told that Akivili may have created other vehicles similar to the Express, which the Nameless used to transport themselves across the cosmos. However, there doesn't seem to be much documentation or any record to corroborate these claims. That being said, it would be funny if we came across another group of the Nameless traveling on a magic space bus. And in any case, what we do know is that the Astral Express was the main vehicle used by Akivili and the Nameless in their travels. But what I find extremely fascinating is that some people believe that the Astral Express is powered by the heart of Akivili. In a conversation with Himiko, she reveals that she was unable to find any evidence to support this claim. Instead, she believes that the Express is able to directly harness the power from the Trailblaze to power itself. If this is true, it would be unorthodox as typically only intelligent sentient beings are able to tap into the power of a path. However, the Express itself was created by the Eon of the Trailblaze, so maybe Akivili was able to directly connect the Express to the power of the Trailblaze. That being said, it still remains to be seen what exactly powers the Express. Now before we move on to the next Eon, I did want to mention theories that I came across regarding Akivili. I'll link in the description box below some resources that detail these theories and served as reference points for me in this video. In the Myriad Celestia trailer, Black Swan, the narrator of the video, directly calls out to Akivili asking them to once again traverse the universe. This seems to suggest that Akivili will be brought back or revived. In addition, Fuli, the Remembrance's prophecy that we talked about earlier, also seems to line up with this idea. So if Akivili were to be revived or brought back, how would that be done? The first theory revolves around Pom Pom, the conductor of the Express. In various dialogue conversations, Himiko and Welt both seem to be unable to recall when Pom Pom first boarded the Express. It's almost as if he showed up one day. 
In addition to this, it appears that Pom Pom plays a pivotal role in maintaining the Express and ensuring its smooth operations. For someone who just randomly popped up, that does seem rather suspicious. As stated earlier, some believe that the heart of Akivili or a piece of Akivili spirit is what powers the Express. So what if Pom Pom is the manifestation of Akivili's spirit or heart that was planted in the Express? That would explain why he's the conductor of the Express and able to control it freely. Additionally, Pom Pom encourages the MC to go on adventures and asks the MC how they're feeling about their latest adventure. He's also the one to give out the rewards for increasing our Trailblaze level, which seems like something the Eon of Trailblaze would do. Another thing I like to point out is that Pom Pom has been to Pagana before. We learn this from the Xianzhou main story quest line, and because of this, it makes me think that he has a deeper connection to Aki Vili than we might think. Last but not least, this seems to parallel similar theories regarding Paimon from Genshin Impact. For example, many people believe that Paimon is linked to the Unknown God or that she is the God of Time mentioned through Genshin Impact's lore. Because of this, many people seem to think that Pom Pom is Akivili or at least a piece of them. If you want more details on this theory, please check out the Reddit post by Titanium Dragon. It goes way more in depth than me in this video on this theory. The final theory that some people seem to have is that the main character is Aki Vili. This line of thought is very closely tied to Elio and the Stellaron Hunters. In the beginning of the game, Kafka and Silverwolf plant a Stellaron into the MC to bring them back to life. Before we're rescued by the members of the Astral Express, Kafka mentions that she and the MC have had history but that they might not remember her. What if this is because the Stellaron Hunters once journeyed alongside Aki Vili? According to this theory, the Stellaron hunters may have been able to recover Akivili's body and use the Stellaron on the Herta space station to revive Akivili. Given the Astral Express was parked at the space station, this would have been the perfect opportunity to reunite the revived Akivili with the Express. It could potentially also explain how the MC is able to draw the gaze of both Nanook and Klippoth. That being said, there is some contradicting dialogue from the Xianzhou main story quest line where Kafka states that she has no idea what happened to Akivili. Also, this theory seems to be a bit dubious in terms of the overall timeline of the Honkai Star Rail universe. Either way, it's an interesting theory to consider. Personally, I'm more in favor of the pom-pom theory, but we'll see as the story progresses. Let me know what your thoughts are on these theories down in the comment section below. Next up, we have Nanook, the Eon of Destruction. Nanook originally came from a star system which was called Adlevoon. According to records from the Astral Express, Adlevoon was a world that was destroyed by the Emperor's War. Later on, it was infested by a faction called the Swarm, which was led by another eon called Tazeronth, the Propagation. It was under these harsh conditions that Nanook lived out their early life. In fact, in the simulated universe, Fuli allows us to view a memory of Nanook's birth. You find yourself becoming a weeping Adlevoon baby with an uncut umbilical cord. You remember that there is a golden scar on your body and golden blood flowing on the dying planet. Growing up in such a war-torn environment, Nanook would eventually adopt the path of destruction and ascend to Eonhood. Shortly after ascending to Eonhood, Nanook took it upon himself to destroy his home system, ending the conflict with the Swarm. In the present day, Nanook and his followers traverse the universe annihilating all worlds that they come across. When researching this video, I discovered that Nanook's background story makes a few references to Inuit religion and mythology. In the Inuit religion, Nanook is the god of the polar bears and was often associated with hunting. As the master and leader of the bears, Nanook would decide if hunters would be successful in their hunt for bears. After a successful hunt, the hunters would have to properly treat the body of the bear and make offerings to Nanook. Failing to do so would result in punishment from Nanook himself. Another reference to Inuit culture and mythology is the name of the star system that Nanook originated from, Adlevoon. In the Inuit religion, Adlevoon represents the underworld and the spirits that reside there. When a living being dies, their spirit will pass into Adlevoon for purification. Once a soul has been purified and cleansed of its impurities, it will ascend to Kudlevoon, which is known as the Paradise of the Moon. However, if a soul or spirit is found unworthy, it would remain in Adlevoon. 
Most descriptions of Ad Lavoon characterize it as a frozen wasteland and basically a place that you don't want to stay in very long. This runs in parallel to Honkai Star Rail's version of Ad Lavoon, except in this case, Ad Lavoon is a star system marred by constant wars. Regardless, I really enjoy these references to Inuit culture, and I feel like I always learn something new when I dive into lore from Hoyoverse games. As the Eon of Destruction, Nanook believes that the birth of the universe is a mistake. They intend to correct this mistake by becoming the avatar of entropy and annihilating everything. In the simulated universe devlog lore entries, these views held by Nanook have confused researchers on the Eon of Destruction. The reason for this is because there appears to be an overlap between the paths of finality and destruction. As we stated earlier, two paths of overlapping ideas will assimilate into each other. Because of this, researchers have wondered why Terminus the Finality has not yet absorbed Nanook. That being said, I think the difference between Nanook and Terminus is the way they view the universe. Nanook believes that the universe was a mistake and should have never been created. Therefore, they seek to destroy the universe. Terminus, on the other hand, seeks to bring an end to all things. While the end result is essentially the same, the core belief system and the means by which they carry out these ends differs significantly. In any case, we'll talk about Terminus in detail in another video, but I wanted to draw a distinction between these seemingly similar eons and their respective paths. As with any eon, Nanook has attracted a group of devout followers. These devout followers have formed two factions that we know of called the Antimatter Legion and the Annihilation Gang. The Antimatter Legion is commanded by Nanook, and their goal is to bring chaos and destruction to all the worlds that they come across. They stand staunchly opposed to life and civilization. Only the most fierce and savage races can join the vast vanguard of the Antimatter Legion. Though it might seem like the Legion travels haphazardly around the cosmos destroying worlds, they can be quite methodical and strategic with carrying out their destruction on a cosmic scale. Within the Legion are strategists that plan out their conquest and destruction of civilizations. There's also the Lord Ravagers who are emanators that are given command of a specific Legion within the Antimatter Legion. Each Lord Ravager has a unique philosophy on destruction which makes them extremely dangerous. That being said, the Antimatter Legion and the Lord Ravagers are feared throughout the cosmos. It is likely that their conquest and destruction will only come to an end when the last flame of civilization is extinguished. Now, not all followers of the destruction are looked upon in favor by Nanook the Destruction. An example of one such group is the Annihilation Gang. There are many species throughout the universe that lack the ability to pursue the utter destruction of worlds and civilizations. In their pursuit of the Path of Destruction, members of the Annihilation Gang seek to gather the attention of Nanook and the Antimatter Legion through cruelty and slaughter. In the truest sense, Destruction and Annihilation is not the primary goal of the Annihilation Gang, as much of their motivation is corrupted by their own selfish, sadistic desires. Because of this, Nanook holds utter contempt for the members of the gang. It is said that the Annihilation Gang will continue to remain in spiritual exile from their Eon until they prove to Nanook their willingness to pursue destruction in its purest form. Aside from the Antimatter Legion and Annihilation Gang, Nanook appears to be very closely associated with the Stellarons and the Fragmentum. In the game, we're told that the Stellarons, also known as the Cancer of All Worlds, has been slowly and steadily spreading throughout the universe. Herta states that she believes the Stellarons are living beings that are tied to a specific path or eon. This theory seems to be somewhat confirmed through the main story quest on Eurilo 6. We see several examples of the Stellaron communicating with the Supreme Guardians and the Stellaron reacting to the wishes of the people living in Bellabog. Given what we know, there does seem to be a certain level of sentience or intelligence that can be associated with the Stellarons. That aside, we also know that the presence of Stellarons can result in the spread of Fragmentum. The Stellaron Corrosion aka the Fragmentum is a type of corruption that morphs living beings. It manifests itself through these crystal-like structures that can spread and corrupt everything surrounding it. From what we can tell so far, the damage caused as a result of the spread of the Stellarons and the Fragmentum is permanent. Permanent. Given these destructive properties, the main theory here is that Nanook is responsible for planting the Stellarons on various planets throughout the universe. 
Additionally, there seems to be a trend where the Antimatter Legion will launch attacks on planets with Stellarons, which gives credence to this theory. Personally, I'm not 100% sold on the idea that Nanook is the progenitor of the Stellarons. Since Nanook's goal is that of complete annihilation of the universe, it would seem odd that they would use the Stellarons to reach this goal. We know that the Stellarons corrupt and transform life, and this seems to stand contradictory to Nanook's goal of the complete destruction of the universe and all its life forms. Additionally, if the Stellarons are actually connected to the will of an eon like Herta hypothesizes, why would the Stellarons save the people of Bellabog by creating the Eternal Freeze? That to me just seems so at odds with the path of destruction and makes me wonder if the Stellarons come from something else. Regardless, what we do know is that we will have to face in the nook the destruction at the end of our journey. Throughout the game, there are a lot of lore entries that associate Nanook with entropy. Now, for those of you unfamiliar, entropy is a scientific concept that measures the disorder within a system. According to the second law of thermodynamics, as time moves forward, entropy or disorder within a system will increase. It is hypothesized that when the maximum amount of entropy is met, it will result in the heat death or complete destruction of the universe. To explain this a bit better, the heat death of the universe is the idea that all energy will become so evenly dispersed throughout the universe that reactions or physical processes will no longer occur. When this happens, the universe will cease to exist and become an empty, cold place. Given this information, it would make sense that our journey ends with us facing off with Nanook, the representation of entropy and the heat death of the universe. According to Kafka, if we continue to follow Elio's plan, there is still hope on the horizon. Also, I kind of wonder if Terminus the Finality will play a role at the end of the journey, but I'll save that for the video later in this series. That being said, that is everything we know about Nanook the Destruction. Honestly, one of my favorite eons, and he just looks so, so cool. I can't wait to see where things go lore-wise in the future of Honkai Star Rail. And now we are at the end of the first installment of this video series on the eons. If you made it to the end of this video, congratulations, that was a lot of content for this first video. I initially went into this thinking I could do one video on all of the eons, but as I did more and more research, I slowly realized that there's actually a ton to talk about. Right now I'm working on the script for the second video and the other parts, but I hope to finish that soon and get you guys more lore on the eons. If you all like this video, don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe, and I will see you guys all next time. Peace!